self-driving cars, biased algorithms, and a social media quiz that scrapes your data. It sometimes feels as if the only tech headlines we read are terrifying. But what about the original promise of tech to innovate and empower? This week, Bex Hong Hurwitz, a Data and Society Fellow, and Rashida Richardson of the AI Now Institute discuss the subversive and democratic potential of technology. And then from the UK, Kaylee Walsh of the tech cooperative Outlandish describes how her group harnessed that potential. All that, plus a primer on how to secure your networks. It's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. Technology is getting pretty scary. From driverless cars that kill people to social media that's pretty darn antisocial to what the Cambridge Analytica story revealed about how much Facebook knows about us and sells, it's enough to swell what some are calling a tech lash. Private companies worth some $3 trillion seem to be taking over our lives. So can we, the people, take control back somehow? The truth is much of the new technology isn't really so new, and it's hard to imagine our daily lives, not to mention the functioning of our major institutions without it. So how to keep the promise without the peril of new tech? My next guest spent a lot of time thinking about the ethics and uses of technology. Bex Hong Hurwitz is a co-founder of Research Action Design, a collective that works to secure digital strategies to support grassroots social movements. They're currently a fellow at Data and Society, where their work focuses on digital safety for activists. Rashida Richardson is the director of policy research at AI Now Institute at NYU, which examines the social implications of artificial intelligence. Okay, starting at the basics. Bex, thanks so much for coming in. Tell us a little bit about how you spend your time. Like, what does your day look like? Yeah, um, let's see, I work with activists um, of all kinds to, um, mainly I've been focusing recently on digital security with activists um, um, and designing, designing new strategies with them about how to use the same tools they're using to reach the people that they need to reach, um, but more securely. So that looks like anything from, from teaching people how, how these tools work, how, just how the business of data impacts their own privacy and security and looking at the risks that draws. So where do you think we are on the kind of peril and promise tilts each edge. Yeah, well, <laughs> we're on an edge. We're on an edge, Yeah, Thanks. Yeah, um, I mean, I think activists are in places online where they need to be, um, and so some of the ways these things are, these tools are designed are, are quite perilous. Um, and, but, but activists also know what they need, and they know what keeps them safe. I mean, activists are in the business of making communities safe. They're in the business of building power together, and so, um, so the strategies that they come up with are brilliant, even within these spaces. Mm. Now, Rashida, what about you? How do you spend your time? And what is the AI Now Institute at NYU? So AI Now focuses on the social implications of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and automation. The work is broken down into a few different areas, but that's the core mission of the organization. And my job is... Uh, few fold, has a few fold. So one is to focus um, or build out work focusing on the civil rights implications because that's right. more aligned with my background, but also looking at policy alternatives. So one major question that comes up a lot is if we know whole segments of populations are going to be out of work because of automation, then how does government prepare for that? Or how do you make sure that certain communities that are already marginalized or harmed in certain ways are not then further impacted by these changes? So give us some examples about the, of the ways that race and gender play out in this AI artificial intelligence world. So part of the problem is that I think people think of AI technology in general as infallible, but they really are human creation. So all the same preferences and biases that we have in the real world can be ingrained in these technologies. So it's thinking through 
how to parse that out or how to at least acknowledge those preferences and biases to make sure that they're not further affirmed in new technology or exasperating existing harm. So um, to answer your question yeah. about gender and bias, one way you could look at it is that um, if we know that women are paid less than men in society and then you create a tool that inputs the same data <laughs> um, about pay discrepancies as if it's a norm, then it's possible for that technology to then just compound that further or just perpetuate the same harm. I have heard that algorithmic sort of a selection processes are being implemented in places I had no idea uh, already. Mm -hmm. We're not talking down the road, but right now. Who wants to talk to that? Oh, I I can go rushing. Yeah. Um, so, it's, so I split it between private and public, and one of the major concerns is around um, government use because those are that's where government resources are used or allocated in certain ways that we don't know, and we think it's humans making the decisions, but a lot of the times it's algorithmic based um, systems. So, one oh, yeah, give, us, give us an example. So, I want to go yeah. apply for a job at a bank. Mm -hmm. um, how does the algorithm treat me differently if I'm a white guy with a college degree or if I'm a black woman with a college degree? So that would be a private example and there you could have an algorithm that scans for resumes so if um, and it all depends on how it's designed so there's certain inputs and variables that are put into the design of an algorithm and it may give certain preferences to schools certain degrees or certain even career experiences but if it's not accounting for who has access to certain opportunities or even how certain like institutions could be equal, but if certain preferences are given to a certain type of degree or a certain institution, then it could favor the white male applicant over the black female applicant in ways that may seem neutral if you're just looking at, yeah. a, at the inputs and outputs of a system. Because we're talking about, I mean, algorithms are basically about putting in data and then in a sense kind of making decisions on the basis of what has happened in the past. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. big numbers replicate big numbers, kind of, right? Is this right? Yeah, and further they try to teach themselves. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a system like Rashida was describing where, where just over time more white men are getting these jobs as, at the bank, then, this, then the system over time thinks that white men are more appropriate for exactly. the job and builds in this sort of discrimination. So how do we undo that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think in general there needs to be greater transparency and accountability around systems because part of the problem is a lot of the systems that we're discussing is our black box algorithm. So we don't know what the inputs are, what the variables are, what weights are given to those variables, and then it's harder to explain the outputs that are coming out. So if you know that a job applicant algorithm is giving a preference to white men, but you just notice that you could just be like the system's neutral so it's just right. the white applicants are better but you if you are not allowed to see what decisions went into creating those outputs then it's no way to really verify whether or not it's neutral or not yeah i mean i'm getting totally depressed in the sense that <laughs> you know, if you're in the business of reimagining the world but you're using technology that is replicating the world we've always known or at least that's the information that's going in how do you change that? And we should just say a lot of banks, for example, are actually using HR algorithmic technology before you ever get to any person for an interview. Isn't that right? How do we invent the new with these tools that are based on the old? Yeah. So I think one important piece is acknowledging that like history has its own biases uh -huh. built into it. So examining, I think you have to at each phase, so the design training data and also looking at how the outputs of an algorithm is used, trying to examine how societal biases, whether they're systemic, structural, or historical, are playing into that. So there, I always give the example of um, the use of false positives and false negatives, mm -hmm. in that you, you can't have it 50-50, it's going to lean one way or the other. And in certain um, algorithmic systems, it's a good idea to be over-inclusive, so having more false positives, especially if it's something around public health, in that you would want someone to if, if it's a cancer screening right. tool, it's better to be over-inclusive because then someone having a secondary screening could help verify whether or not they're walking around with something that could kill them. Whereas if it's a government tool, let's say dealing with policing, and that means, and it's leaning towards being overly inclusive, that means certain people will have greater interactions with law enforcement that may not be necessary and therefore sort of being a driver into mass incarceration or creating more turmoil in communities. So I think you have to look at the role of the tool and then all of the variables in it and just kind of think about 
how are the problems that we know of in society playing out with this tool? Because I think algorithmic tools have value, but you just have to understand them to figure out how they are creating greater harm rather than uh, in ra rather being a tool for good. Uh, all right, so Bex, cheer me up with some great examples. <laughs> yeah. Of that. That's the easiest, well, like, tech in great well, way. Yeah, a lot, a lot of the work that I've done is focused on collaborative approaches to design and development of technology and media. And, um, and what that means is really looking at the ways that technology can be extremely discriminatory and perilous, and then looking at, well, who taking, yeah, asking questions about who created it, who made decisions about how this thing was designed, who made decisions about what questions this thing is yeah. trying to answer in the first place. Um, so especially the work that I've, that I've done with research action design and before that at the Center for Civic Media at MIT, um, we were looking at co-design, collaborative design. So not everyone's a technologist, um, but activists are specialists in their communities. Um, and so working with activists to design um, technologies to ask these questions together of like, what's the purpose of this tool? Um, what are your greatest hopes for it? What are your greatest fears about it? Let's design around these things. Um, leads to technologies that serve communities. So if you were going to redesign Uber, for example. <laughs> you would start with the drivers. You would, you know, if, it's, if Uber is truly a tool that, that changes labor um, and makes yeah, and it makes the lives of drivers better and their work more dignified than you start with the workers and ask them, what do they need? What do they need out of their days? What do they need to make their work, yeah, more dignified? We talked with uh, Mary Kay Henry, the president of the SEIU Service Employees Union the other day, and she talked about how technology could be a friend or a foe for, for workers. How are we, I mean, are you seeing intersections between consumers and labor organizations and policymakers and developers? Is that connection happening yet? Um, I, think, I think it's happening in little bits. So I'm, I'm in my fellowship at Data and Society, which is a research institute where people are researching a whole range of um, topics, including artificial intelligence and algorithmic accountability. Um, I think some of those connections are being made there, looking at the ways that um, that we might impact some of some of some of the um, sort of ways that data is impacting society and culture um, by making these connections. Okay, so one last well, one question that's on a different, slightly different tangent: the social component of all this. I mean, sometimes I hear this whole sector be referred to as a movement. Is it? Do you feel like it's a movement? Is there a person-to-person -person sense of progress together? I know Data and Society holds events, brings you all off your computers to talk to each other. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think there's a specific movement yet. Yeah. I, th I think the people power piece is missing, and that's something that, like, I think as, as these sort of algorithmic systems start to impact more and more workers, for instance, then, then the labor unions start to understand that the power of the labor union could be brought to bear on this problem of algorithmic accountability, and that's where we'll have movements. Yeah, I mean, her, her example was something like Salesforce, could enable just the bosses to give people last minute assignments, or it could enable the workers to actually have more flexibility in their mm -hmm. lives. But it depends who's calling the shots. Well, and I think the, I think I w would say like we're, if there is a movement, we're in the nascent stages of it because I think there's an asymmetry with the access to information in that if you're not aware of how systems affect you, then it's hard to advocate for yourself. And I don't think that a movement is not possible. It's just I think there needs to be broader public education and also just connections between those in the more technical fields and those who are impacted to ensure that it's a conversation that is interdisciplinary and across all sort of cross sections of society. So that way we're creating solutions that help <laughs> rather than hurt. New York City implemented a, pro a program with Mozilla not so long ago around immigrant rights. How did that look? What did that look like? Yeah, so um, the city of New York started to ask this question um, after the election. Um, what, what would it be like if New York City committed to being a digital sanctuary city in addition to being a sanctuary city? Um, and especially taking a look then at the ways that um, groups that are doing immigration service support or immigration activism hold a lot of data, very sensitive data, and, and what would it mean to support those organizations specifically to increase their digital security. So, um, so I've been working with yeah, collaborators at Mozilla Foundation and with the Mayor's Office of Immigration Affairs um, to, to support 20 different organizations that are doing immigration service work to increase their digital security. Both, like, like you're saying, like the knowledge of how these systems are built and how, and how privacy and security issues might enter into the work just because of using digital. Um, and also some political means that we have for, for shifting the, the structures around us. Are there new laws that we need? 
So New York is actually uh, leading <laughs> in this area in that um, at, in January of this year, a new bill became a law that's creating a task force to look at algorithmic accountability. So looking at government use of algorithms, where they're being used, how they're being used, if someone or even a community is harmed, what should redress look like? Um, how should outside researchers have access to information? How should things be explained to the public so people are empowered to engage? Um, and then what's the process for sort of looking at how tools are developed moving forward? We produced a series not so long ago on digital security addressing the surveillance question, which I guess is where we began. Mm. And one of the points made very strongly in that series was that tech doesn't need to be so scary. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm feeling guilty about introducing this segment, talking about the scariness, um, because I'm hearing from you that we actually need more people involved, more people engaged. But how do people who are not tech savvy or fit the profile that we're given in our media of the stereotypical new tech person engage with this beyond just as a consumer? I think you just have to meet people where they're at. I think it's constantly assumed that people don't understand very complex systems. Um, but I always use the example of um, Virginia Eubanks has a book, Automating Inequality. And when I was on the train reading it, every time people would look at it and they're like, what is that book about? And then I would explain it and every com and it was like a week period where this happened maybe five times on the train. And every time I would explain what an algorithm is, how the government uses them, someone's like, oh, that's this. Like I'm a teacher. And I've been wondering how I've been getting evaluated. And like people get it. It's just you need to have those conversations and not assume that no one has like a basic understanding. Bex, anything you'd add to that? Yeah, um, there are so many ways to talk about technology. <laughs> we, we don't all have to speak code. Mm -hmm. um, and so people, yeah, people can talk about the impacts technology has on their lives. And that's a valuable contribution to design and policy. Well, I want to thank you both for kicking off this conversation, which I hope will just be the beginning one of many on this show, because this is really an era we want to talk about shifting power mm -hmm. rather than having power shift us. Thanks, Rashida, Bex. You can find more information at our website. I'm Kaylee. I work with Outlandish, and we're a work co-op in Finsbury Park, sunny Finsbury Park today. I had a job that I did not enjoy at all a couple of years ago, and I think I was probably one of the only left-wing people that at least spoke about politics kind of openly in the organisation. So somebody that I used to work with got in touch and said, do you want a new job? And I said, yeah. I didn't know what it was. I said, yes. <laughs> um, and it turned out it was outlandish. And um, we were transitioning from an LLP to a cooperative during that time. So I, I came in like basically at the right moment to, to start understanding and be introduced to cooperatives. We find that the ethos is very important, so at least an appreciation of the cooperative values. You don't have to know exactly what they are, but be open to them. There's a lot of work around awareness of worker co-ops in the UK. Not a lot of people know what they are. I think I've, I meet a lot of people who are well within the co-op movement and can tell you everything, whereas my friends or kind of people on the fringes think it's a great idea but don't know what it is. Um, and then second of all, the, the processes of setting up co-ops, it's really bureaucratic. There are a handful of people in the UK who actually know how to set up a co-op. Um, and those people, I'm friends with quite a few of them, acknowledge that they're heading towards retirement soon and they need to kind of pass the baton on. So even things like that, like how do you set it up? Where do you set it up? Who do you talk to? Like, what do you need to pay? All of, all of that knowledge is not shared enough. And I understand why Thatcher brought worker co-ops to their knees. She didn't want any worker co-ops in the UK. So it's taking a battering, but it, it needs to get itself, it has got itself off, up, up onto its feet. But I think for me, the next kind of cycle is streamlining that and, and, and making it as well known as social enterprises or B Corps or uh, kind of these more modern, um, like friendly ways of doing business, worker co-op should be the first thing that people think of. We know that there's a lot of untoward stuff that goes on in tech. We know that tech is highly exploitative because of the startup kind of uh, ways of thinking, like inject some cash in, exploit your workers, sell it and get out. We, that's wrong. It's, there, is no, there is no scenario there that is positive. I think that worker co-ops could provide an alternative to that in any industry.
but it's, for me, it just always goes back to this awareness. It's always going to loop back to it in some way. For our next working holiday, we are trying to come up with content for us. I see lots of people who don't trust technology, and I, I completely empathise with them. I'm kind of here to say, listen, there's an alternative, and we're, on, we're, we're going to work with you and, and, um, and try and make it better, basically. We, we, work, we work in a completely transparent way with clients, with people that work with us, with people in our network, because that's just how we think it should be. It's quite interesting because Jeremy Corbyn is our local MP, and we've always had a good relationship with him, so we built his website for free when he was our local MP. Um, we supported the, the leadership campaign, and we still take care of his website now. Because we want to make the world a better place through technology, using technology, we also think that things like using data in a more accessible, understanding way is, is a positive, and it is a political thing. An example is School Cuts, which is a website that we built. It makes government data around education funding transparent, so you can look up any school in England or Wales and you can find out how much those budget is going to be cut by, basically. Um, because 91% of schools in England and Wales will have their budgets cut. And the, the government can rightly say, the data is on, on, our, on the website, it's on .gov.uk website, but actually when you go on it's not accessible at all. And last election it was a real talking point, and we actually did a, a, an election special for that particular website where we put the three main party manifestos, we used their data um, to, to map how, how much they were going to cut school budgets by. So the Liberal Democrats were saying, we'll support education. Actually, they were making a lot of cuts to education. They, that, that's what they had planned to do. Labour were the only party from the three main parties who were going to give money to schools. Things like that for voters are extremely important. You can have the wall pulled over your eyes really easily. That's the power of technology and making government data. We just took it from them, you know, like, it's publicly available, making it transparent to the public. This is, this is what the general public care about. We're happy for it to be political because we think we're on the right side of politics um, and we will continue to work like that. Equality Labs and The Laura Flanders Show are excited to help you secure your network access. Securing your network access is crucial to being able to access the internet safely as your internet service provider or ISP is often where much surveillance happens. If you do not secure your network access, you are not only revealing your location and the content of your internet browsing to ISPs like Verizon, AT&T, and Comcast, but also they can then filter, surveil, and even block sites from you at their own servers. A VPN or Tor are like condoms for your computer to access the internet safely. Use a virtual private network or VPN to connect to the internet. A VPN will privatize your network searches so that your browsing data is only your own and not the internet companies. Not all VPNs are alike, so read their privacy policy and confirm how long they store your data and under what terms they will surrender it. When not using a VPN, the Tor browser is an excellent option to provide anonymity and to bypass censorship. Always make sure you update your Tor browser regularly. Use extensions like HTTPS Everywhere and Privacy Badger to secure your browsing. Use DuckDuckGo to replace your search engine. That way your search history is not being tracked. Tails is a live operating system that aims to preserve your privacy and anonymity. It is a complete operating system designed to be used from a DVD, USB stick, or SD card independent of any computer's original operating system. That's it for now. For tips and support, please visit equalitylabs.org or our curriculum site at digitalsecurityforall.org. For more reporting and journalism that matters, please visit lauraflanders.com.